Good afternoon. Welcome to the Dean's Speaker Series. Uh, dean Lyons is running a little late, so, uh, so I'll be kicking this off. Clearly, I'm not the dean, nor am I the speaker. Um, I do have a series of introductory remarks to introduce uh, Bob Shanks to you all. Uh, my name is Matt Field. I graduated uh, University of California, Berkeley at the business school with an MBA in class of 2000. I joined uh, Ford Finance upon graduation, moving to Michigan. Uh, presently, I'm the CFO of Lincoln Motor Company, which is our luxury brand within Ford. Um, and uh, I'll be introducing Bob to give you a little better perspective on his background and, and my perception of him. And I'll be positive because I work for him. <laughs> Bob is the chief financial officer at Ford Motor Company. He's held this role since 2012. Throughout his distinguished career, he's moved throughout the company, holding many roles as CFO, starting in Taiwan, well, starting in the US originally, but working in Taiwan, uh, being the CFO of Mazda, the CFO of Premier Auto Group, which was a holding company we had, which owned, uh, boy, I don't know if I can remember the Jaguar, Land Rover, Aston Martin, Volvo, Lincoln was part of that, as well as Europe. He was controller of the Americas, as well as corporate controller during the Great Recession. Leadership is more than titles, however, and uh, I've come to appreciate that over my years of working with Bob. Um, I started in, in uh, Michigan and then moved shortly thereafter to Asia, where uh, I was the financial planning and analysis manager. And I'd spent weeks or months preparing for a business review with Bob on our business plan. And uh, so I was a little intimidated when he showed up. But one of my colleagues who I'd worked with for years, she was Taiwanese and had worked with Bob in Taiwan, ran up to him and gave him a big hug, which uh, was, uh, was a little surprising to me because always, I'd always found him intimidating. Um, and so it made me realize the depth of his leadership and the impact he has on the people he works with. And over the years, I've come to appreciate that because he's not just a strong corporate leader with strong business acumen that other leaders within the company turn to for advice and counsel, but he really takes a leadership role on peop with people in the company. He's the executive champion for GLOBE, Ford's, Ford's LGBT resource group, and he's been a strong advocate for working women diversity, as well as the environment for the campus with our campus transformation starting in the next couple of years. So with that, let me ask you to provide a big warm house welcome to Bob Shanks. Thank you, and Matt, your career is going very well. <laughs> but we won't hug right now. So thanks for having me here. Uh, let me say right off the bat that it's uh, a bit of a quirk of fate that I'm actually standing here to talk to you. Uh, I actually didn't intend to go into business. Uh, at the age of 14, which was nearly 50 years ago, I planned to go into the US Foreign Service. In fact, uh, I applied to only one college for my undergraduate degree, which in retrospect was incredibly foolish but it worked out, uh, and that was Georgetown. And the reason that I did that is because at that time, and perhaps even today, it was the only university that offered a degree in foreign service. And because I was so sure that I knew what I wanted to do with my life, which was to serve the country and to serve uh, in, in a role in foreign service. So after completing Georgetown, after completing my graduate school, uh, I took the foreign service entry exams, which was in line with my grand life plan, and I passed all the tests, so everything was going great. I was right on track with everything that I wanted to do, and all I had to do was wait for a call from the Foreign Service sometime over the following 12 months, uh, because that's just how that process worked at the time. And I couldn't wait to see which exciting country to which I might be posted. So since I had to wait for the call, I needed a job in the interim, and I didn't want to waste time, so prior to joining at least what I expected to do, join the Foreign Service. Uh, my priority was to find work, and so I decided I wanted to do that with a large firm. I wanted to do that with a firm that had a strong international presence because of my interest in things uh, of an international sort. I also like cars, so what I did is I tried to get a job with Ford. I was ultimately successful, but after being rejected twice, uh, and I began to work, and then I waited for the phone to ring from the Foreign Service. And I waited, and I waited some more, and then finally the year was up. 
So if I still wanted to enter the Foreign Service, I would have to start that entire process uh, all over again. And obviously I didn't. And the reason I didn't is because at the time I was 24 years old, and I have to tell you, I was absolutely, even at that age and, and time and, and where I was in the business, I was absolutely fascinated and intrigued by the business and the company that I was now a part of, and that was all the way back in 1977. So I have been with Ford now nearly 40 years, and I want to tell you that I am incredibly thankful that the Foreign Service never called. <laughs> the way that I describe it, I've effectively had the life I wanted to live, I've just been better paid living it. <laughs> so here we are today, and I, and I really am tremendously honored on behalf of Ford Motor Company uh, to talk to you, and I'm very, very flattered by Dean Lyons' invitation. I was telling uh, a group earlier, I accepted the invitation. Uh, I didn't really know what the series was all about. I accepted it because it was so far in advance. Uh, I thought, sure, why not? Uh, I then later went online to find out, uh, you know, what types of remarks uh, were made to this, um, this forum. <laughs> I, was, I was floored by the people that come and speak here. I just couldn't imagine why anybody had asked me to come to speak. So it was quite intimidating to think I was going to be following people like Merkel and Gore and, you know, on and on and on. But I think it perhaps is appropriate because I'm not here because of me. I'm here because of Ford Motor Company. And certainly there are so many tremendously exciting, transformative, exciting things that are happening today in the world around uh, mobility. So as I was thinking about what I would like to share with you today, it did cause me to reflect a bit on my career, uh, which is something that I do more and more at this point in my life. And I do recognize it's very unusual for uh, people to work at one place for such a long period of time these days because the expectations are that you'll hop in from one company to the next. But my experience has given, given me a, a fascinating perspective on how one of America's most iconic brands and one of its most iconic companies has evolved over time, and also what role it might play in the future. So I'd like to take my time with you today and share with you some observations on a few of those changes and why, after over a decade of research, investment, and innovation, Ford is in an excellent position to not only grow our business beyond our core pillars of trucks, vans, utilities, and performance vehicles, to take a leadership position in autonomy, electrification, and mobility solutions. But you know, it's really hard to appreciate where we are now without understanding a little bit about where we came from, particularly in recent years. In fact, in just 10 years from now, in the past, the company was in a very, very different position than we find ourselves today we were dealing with some really, really tough challenges. Most importantly, our North American business, which was and still is uh, the biggest part of the business, was in terrible, terrible shape. So in late 05, Mark Fields and I both came back from, from Europe to start to work uh, in North America. And this was before the Great Recession. We started a massive, a deep, and I can tell you with, uh, with all transparency, a very painful restructuring of our North American business. In the fall of 2006, we took out a loan and committed credit facility of over $20 billion to fund our turnaround and to continue to invest in new products and technologies. Now, this required us to collateralize literally everything, including the Blue Oval. So this required us to do that. It then resulted in a credit rating that fell into deep junk bond status. So we had a horrible, horrible balance sheet. About the same time, actually a little bit later, we started a, another transformation, which is a transformation of the entire company around something that we call the One Ford Plan. And that started when Alan Mulally, some of you may know him, uh, joined us to lead the company from Boeing. And in simple terms, what that was was essentially the globalization of Ford itself from a collection of autonomous regions into a single global enterprise, which is actually something that we had tried to do about a decade earlier, but had failed. We realized at that time that if we didn't change, and perhaps I should say radically transform, not just change, we would not have a future. So this is 2005, 2006, well before the Great Recession. We weren't very coy or subtle about our point of view. In fact, at the 2006 auto show at Los Angeles, I remember this, we stated that everybody in the auto industry, everybody, not just Ford, had to change or die. 
change or die, and those are the words that we used, change or die. Two years later, just as we were making progress on the North American restructuring and could see some light at the end of the tunnel, and we were also still in the early days of our one forward plan, the Great Recession hit. We thought things had been difficult up to that point, but then it really turned bleak, to say the least. We thought we had been in crisis mode for the past three years, but I can assure you that no one then working in Ford had ever faced a set of circumstances as dire as we did in late 2008 and in the first half of 2009. It's such moments that the true qualities of a management team and a corporate culture come to the surface. Now fortunately, because of the head start or foresight that we had in restructuring our important North American business, as well as starting the transformation of our global business, combined with the fact that we took out all that debt and committed credit facility, we were in a position to survive. Although I have to tell you, there were incredibly difficult and tense moments, both on a professional basis, but on a personal basis. Because all of us had equity in the game, both literally and figuratively, and we were looking at being wiped out along with the whole company. But I have to tell you that even when faced with this type of environment, we realized that we need to change even further. So we made two additional big bets at that time. The first one is that we decided that we needed to invest heavily in our efforts to boost fuel economy. So for example, the initial direction from Mark Fields to pursue an all aluminum body on the F-150, which has been a huge success, was decided in 2009, just at the time that we were at the worst point. We also focused on developing a host of new technologies and new areas. We did this because we saw, even at that time, that people's needs were evolving quickly and the world itself was changing dramatically. So it was a very challenging time and one that I personally will never forget, including a drive that I took in a car because we weren't allowed to take the company plane to and from Washington in December of uh, 2008 uh, with Al Mulally to testify before both houses of Congress along with the heads of General Motors, Chrysler, uh, and the UAW. But obviously, in retrospect, it was a period that we navigated successfully, as demonstrated by the fact that if you look at the 2010 through 2015 period, that period was capped last year with record profits, record operating margin, and record cash flow. So you might think that we would just continue to refine our business model, uh, adjust our business just as appropriate, tweak it to continue that uh, great success that we've had over these last number of years, but I can tell you that has not been our mindset. Yes, clearly we intend to keep the core business strong, but we also have been thinking very, very deeply about the future, and I don't mean just next year or five years from now, which is our normal business planning cycle, but we've been thinking about what is the world like that we're going to be living in in 2025, 2030. And I can tell you that we recognize that there is something occurring, and it's a seismic shift in the transportation landscape and how customers view mobility itself. We're also asking ourselves, in that environment, what would a successful auto manufacturer look like at that point in time? And in answering that question, what we see over the horizon is something that looks significantly different than the auto company that we have been for 113 years. One of the biggest trends that we've grappled with as part of this is the fact that cities globally are getting bigger and more congested. This trend has created a host of serious challenges. Traffic is shaving off slices of GDP in some countries and creating a lot of pollution affecting the health of huge populations. So we began to scowl the world for new ideas that led us to pursue powerful new directions in electrification, autonomy, and mobility. Together, innovations in these areas are leading our transformation yet again from just an auto company to an auto and a mobility company and helping us to usher in a new era in the way in which all of us move. So let me start with electrification. We're currently investing four and a half billion dollars through the end of the decade to introduce 13 new electric vehicles on top of the five that's already in our lineup today. So by 2020, we expect 40% of our lineup will be electrified. These products will help reduce pollution 
and B, particularly useful for short haul delivery in urban areas, particularly those that already are restricting and controlling traffic. This investment will also position us as a leader in a growing market when by 2030, we expect electrified vehicles to make up more than half of all vehicles sold globally. At the same time, we've dramatically accelerated our autonomy research, which is something that we actually began uh, back about 2004 or 2005, when we started a program with our F-250 Super Duty pickup as part of the DARPA challenge. Recently, in fact, last month, Mark Fields announced that we're going into high volume production of a fully autonomous vehicle, which will be commercially available for a ride hailing service by 2021. That means that Ford will be selling a vehicle in this time frame with no steering wheel, no brake pedal, no gas pedal, no driver. Now, if somebody had told you 10 years ago, five years ago, that a major auto company would announce the mass production, so we're talking about 100,000 units a year or more, of a vehicle with no steering wheel, they would have said you were crazy. I would have said you're crazy. That's how fast the world is changing. And it has changed, and we're very proud of the fact that we are part of that change and we're helping to drive that change. Autonomous vehicles are an ideal transportation solution in many environments. They'll save lives, they'll cut down on pollution, they'll give people more productive time, they'll reduce traffic in urban areas, and even for people like me, when I get a little bit older, I'll have freedom of mobility. A key factor here is that the world is moving from just owning vehicles to owning and sharing them. We see autonomous vehicles playing a big role in ride hailing services, and that's why we believe by 2030, autonomous vehicles in the US may account for up to one in 10 miles traveled and up to 20% of annual vehicle sales. That's just 14 years from now. Now, because cities face some of the most vexing transportation challenges, we're also working on their behalf to help them solve their, their problems with a group that we call Ford City Solutions who will partner with cities around the world to help them implement new ideas and mobility solutions. Now, no two cities are alike, so we're also constantly expanding the set of solutions that we offer tailored to the particular requirements of that particular city. So, for example, earlier this month, we announced that we acquired Chariot, which is a dynamic shuttle service. It's a crowdsourced shuttle that adapts where people want to go based on demand, which is a very, very powerful idea for a number of reasons. You look at the transportation infrastructure of a city and it's pretty baked in. You can't easily create a new subway line. Dynamic shuttles don't require any infrastructure upgrades and they can be optimized to help the largest number of people. As a result, we're rolling out our shuttle service to six markets over the next 18 months, starting over the bridge in San Francisco. There's a social justice element to this as well. Many underserved communities don't have convenient access to mass transit. It's a silent barrier to progress. So we look at these shuttles also as a way of creating new opportunities for many people. Let's talk about mobility. Mobility in general is an incredible business opportunity, as is autonomy. The global automotive market is about a $2.3 trillion business, and today, Ford gets about 6% of that, which is about $150 billion a year in revenue. The mobility space is estimated to be about twice that size today, $5.4 trillion, and it's growing, and we get none of it. Dynamic shuttles are one useful tool, but we're also really excited about bike sharing. We've partnered with Motivate to create the Ford Go Bike program in San Francisco. We're working with city officials to add new stations and increase the number of bikes to 7,000 in the Bay Area by the end of 2018. And the data that we generate from those bikes are also going to help us determine the best routes for our dynamic shuttles, improving mobility across the city. So you've been hearing me talk about bicycles, vehicles without steering wheels, and shuttle buses. Maybe not exactly what you thought you'd hear from a CFO of a major auto company. So 
Perhaps that's not what you were expecting. But I'll tell you, that's because we recognize it for that in order to stay true to our core mission of helping people get to where they want to go and making their lives better, we need to change yet again. Which is not to say that we're not deeply committed to making amazing cars, utilities, and trucks. That's always gonna be a part of our business model. We're very, very proud of that business, and that business is gonna fund the new Ford of the future. We will continue to be among the leaders in the industry with award-winning vehicles that get people excited and meet their needs, and we know how to do that really well. But with the strong core business, investing in these emerging opportunities that I've touched on will enable us to significantly grow our position in both fields, our core business, as well as these new areas of emerging opportunities, and drive value for our shareholders over the next century. And I believe that when we look back at this moment, we'll view this as the most transformative time in the transportation industry in over 100 years. And I have to say that in my nearly 40 years, I have never been so excited to come to work and looking forward to what awaits just around the bend. Now, since I've been speaking at one of the finest schools in the world, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the talent it will take to keep Ford ahead of our competition during this time of transition. And I think of this in three buckets, inspire, acquire, and hire. And I can tell you we have an amazing team at Ford Motor Company everywhere around the world, and one that has done a tremendous job when it comes to strengthening our core business and frankly, to changing. Our job as company leaders is to inspire that workforce when it comes to this new shift and how people think about transportation solutions. This includes providing a clear vision, a clear path forward, and a clearly conveyed set of priorities. We have a lot of choices ahead of us in terms of where we play, how we're gonna win, what we're not going to do, what we will do. This shift also requires a fresh look at what we currently do really well, what we don't do so well, and what other companies we can acquire or partner with in order to continue to transform our core business and to accelerate and capitalize on the emerging opportunities. So for example, our recent acquisition of Chariot also means that we're bringing in a number of smart, talented individuals to the Ford family. And as a leadership team, it's our job to leverage their talent to not only generate new revenue, but also to accelerate the cultural shift of the broader business. At the same time that we're inspiring and acquiring, we're also looking to build a pipeline of talent that will strengthen both our core and our emerging businesses, which is one of the reasons that I've traveled here today with my colleagues to speak with you. I hope you leave here having learned something about the industry and particularly something about Ford. So to conclude, I'd like to look back once again at where we were in 2008 as a CFO. At the end of that year, the share, uh, a share of Ford stock cost less than a gallon of gas. But the decisions we made in those challenging times has led to a remarkable outcome. We emerged a stronger, healthier, bigger company, and we're ready to transform yet again and to help lead the industry into a new future. So with that, I'd like to thank you for inviting Ford to talk to you today, and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you might have. How are you? Hello, Bob. Good to see you, Good Bob, you. and thank you for thank being you. here. I had a, there's a World Academic Summit that I had to be here, and I'm sorry that I missed the beginning of this session, but as, uh, as uh, you have, have already been introduced, uh, I, we welcome you here. We thank you for being here, and Q&A, a really important part of every one of our sessions. Please use the microphones because we do want to capture, capture it on video, so whoever has a question. And you please. can ask anything. asking anything. <laughs> Maybe I should go back and think about it more. Um, so my question, I am, 
has basically two parts. One is that how do you think about acquiring a, a, a technology versus having it a homegrown, like developed in the country? Like GM recently acquired cruise automation, but you seem like you are doing that inside the company. So how are you thinking about that? And then the other question is with acquisition generally, because these companies are smaller companies, startups, the culture is very different. Mm -hmm. How do you think about creating a culture that actually um, brings that uh, that smaller mm -hmm. culture within it? Yeah, that's a very good question. Questions. So um, I, I think it goes back to what I, I referred to earlier. So we really have to know ourselves very honestly and transparently in terms of you know, what our expertise and competence is, uh, what it isn't, uh, what do we need to particularly take advantage of these new emerging opportunities, which in, in some cases require you know, a level of competence and knowledge, talent that we perhaps don't have to the degree that we need uh, internally. So I think that, that knowledge and, and being very frank and open about that to yourself is important. Uh, we can then decide, um, and we actually do this, we decide uh, to kind of beef it up internally, but then we can also decide to just go out and buy it. And sometimes it can be an entire company or a group of a company. Uh, we've done things such as uh, with Pivotal. I don't know if any of you know Pivotal. It's a software company in the valley here. Uh, it's very, very good. It's been working with us for some time. Uh, we made an equity investment in, so we get some strategic uh, opportunities and sort of an advantageous position perhaps with them. Uh, we've worked with them to create uh, software hubs uh, with us in various parts of the country, including back in Dearborn in Michigan, where uh, they're working on our problems with us uh, and they're working side by side with some of our own internal software engineers. So again, to transfer knowledge, but also to augment that knowledge, not through acquisition, but through partnership. So I think it's, it's just a question of understanding what you need and then pulling all the levers available to make sure that we can bring in that appropriate talent. Now, to your point about um, you know, bringing in a, a smaller company or a, you know, a different company, I think there what we want to do is we bought them for a reason, right? And you don't want to bring them in and crush them by you know, making them part of the big Ford, all of our rules, all of our ways of doing business and so forth. You want to allow them to be who they are because that's why you bought them in the first place. So I think we'll be very thoughtful and very careful about you know, allowing them to breathe and, uh, and to provide the benefits to us that attracted us in the first place uh, and protect them. But you know, to some extent, uh, we also will want to make them part of the broader Ford. We also don't want them to be so separate. If you remember my comments, we want culture change also back in the broader company. And so we want to be able to make sure there's a, an opportunity for that to happen as well. Hi, my name is Santiago. I'm a second year full-time MBA. Uh, my question is around mobility. Um, you mentioned each city is different and has different challenges. Um, and I'd be curious to know, uh, in the acquisition of Chariot, which, um, in, in terms of scale, what do you hope to, to provide to this company, um, especially to expand quickly? Um, I interned in during the summer, so I'd be curious. Okay. Yeah, we see this as a, as a big opportunity. As you know, some of, um, some of the big player, the, the big player, obviously, Uber, you know, in terms of ride sharing, ride hailing, uh, Lyft, I think, is the next one, in the U.S. anyway, about 20%. Uh, GM's got a, a small equity position in them. Uh, we actually see a lot of opportunities in uh, dynamic shuttles because one of, the, one of the disadvantages, if you will, of, of an Uber or Lyft, uh, and cities will tell you this, is you have all these, all these cars going around the city, you know, looking for uh, drivers, uh, or rather uh, rides, and creating actually congestion. Uh, so one of, the, one of the advantages of a dynamic shuttle, because again, this is not a fixed route, it's really based on the demand of, of whoever's uh, using the service. You know, we see an opportunity to actually have near taxi-like service, not quite, but near taxi-like service, but also in a very comfortable, safe environment, uh, and also leveraging products that we make today, like the transit van, but perhaps modified in terms of the interior to provide a really uh, comfortable, welcome environment where people can feel uh, uh, comfortable while they're there, they can do work, Wi-Fi, you know, the whole thing, uh, that we can uh, provide that same type of service, but in a way that's more friendly to the city in terms of congestion and solving, you know, some of the um, mobility needs of, of people who are willing to, to try that particular alternative. So we think it uh, has a lot of um, legs to it. We've talked with a number of cities are quite interested in that. If you think further down the road when maybe a transit is electrified or, you know, 
battery electric is even potentially even more attractive because of the fact it's it's basically completely friendly from an environmental standpoint. So I think we see a lot of opportunity there. So already, and we just bought the company last month, we're looking at plans to expand it in six cities, including some outside the US. Okay, thank you. I didn't know if you were leaving or asking for a question. <laughs> I call the financial crisis. GM had a whole lot of uh, government bailout money. Chrysler had to kind of partner with Fiat. How is Ford able to maintain a much more independence than, those, than the other two legs of the big three? Well, I think it's three things. Uh, as I said earlier, we, um, you know, all of those companies had horrible business models in North America. And, and for all of them, they were and they still are, although GM is now quite large in China, uh, still the biggest parts of those businesses. They were in terrible shape, terrible, terrible shape. So we got a head start. We actually started you know, the big transformation of North America, our, our North America, back at the end of 05. We started developing what was called the Way Forward Plan on October 1st of 05. We went to the board in December. <coughs> we announced it in January. We had to keep revising it because things kept changing, as is the way these types of things work. But we had a head start. Uh, we ultimately ended up reducing our salaried uh, headcount by half over the three-year period. Our hourly, we closed uh, more than 10 plants. Uh, maybe it was even 20, including the parts. I mean, it was, it was painful. A lot of people's lives were affected. But that head start, along with the fact that we took out that enormous loan, along with the committed credit facility, which you know, trashed the balance, the balance sheet, if you will, uh, but it did give us the liquidity that we needed to support the restructuring. But then when the downturn occurred, you know, we, had, we had substantial funds that uh, the other two didn't have. Now the third though is if the government had not come in and bailed out uh, GM and Chrysler, I'm not saying they bailed it out in the right way, but if they had not done that, it probably would have brought down the entire industry. So not just Ford, the suppliers, the dealers, I mean it would have been a, it would have been a disaster in terms of jobs, communities, lives, and so forth. So I think they did the right thing, and frankly if they hadn't, we probably also would not have survived because it just would have been a whole industry meltdown. Uh, but because they did do that, we were then able to get through that with our own resources for the reasons that I mentioned. Okay. Good afternoon, Sam Becerra, second year MBA. Hi. Uh, two questions, one is uh, regarding infrastructure. With the mass transform, uh, transformation in, in the automotive industry, there will likely need to be change in the infrastructure. What do you see um, that looking like? And do you see yourself partnering with municipalities or federal agencies to do that? Uh, so that's one question. Second is uh, regarding cars. So just ask one because I'm so old I can't remember it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it at that no, one. Yeah. Just, just, just wait. You can ask the second sure. one after I finish this. So yeah, I think there will be changes. Um, but actually, for example, on autonomy, you know, some people have thought that you're going to have to have vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure communications. We're actually designing. Uh, our autonomous vehicles, and I think others are doing the same way, so that's not required. I think that will happen over time, which will make uh, autonomy even more effective and efficient uh, than, it is, than it will be initially, but I don't think it's going to be necessary initially. Um, some people have talked about the fact, not infrastructure, I, I understood that part of the question, that autonomy, for example, will decimate uh, you know, automotive sales, and so that's going to have a big effect on companies like Ford. But, and we've done a lot of work on this. We've, uh, we've also read what a lot of consultants are saying, cell site analysts and so forth. You know, the thing that's interesting about autonomous vehicles, today your personal vehicle, if you have one, you're probably using it about 4% of the time. An autonomous vehicle is gonna operate 90% of the time. So it's gonna wear out faster. So even if we make it more robust in terms of the, um, you know, the standards and specifications, of the vehicle, it will still wear out faster. So they'll be used more constantly so they'll be turning faster. Mm -hmm. So that's why when I mentioned in my comments, 20% of sales, our view, by 2030 will be autonomous vehicles. That's because there, there's just so many of them that are continuing to turn over because of the degree to which they're utilized. So we don't really see that as affecting overall industry sales to any significant degree at this point. But in terms of infrastructure, I think that will happen over time, but it's not sort of a, a requirement or a roadblock. There's another aspect of infrastructure I'll just touch on quickly, which is regulatory environment. Uh, one of the things that we will have to have 
is an appropriate regulatory environment around uh, autonomy. Um, and uh, that's something that fortunately the government's already uh, moving on quite proactively. In fact, I think it was last week NHTSA announced a framework or guidelines of policies around autonomous vehicles that have to be fleshed out more. But we were very supportive of what they issued and the direction they're taking because the one thing we do want to avoid is you know, 50 different uh, regulations or frameworks by state or even by city that uh, we have to follow because it would be incredibly expensive to do that. The other aspect of infrastructure I'll just touch on quickly is, uh, is electrification. I think there, uh, there clearly has to be a lot of, uh, of work done. So far in the U.S. it appears that it's likely to be more of a, a private venture driven initiative in Germany, uh, for example, I think there the government is more, being more proactive and involved in, in creating that infrastructure. Uh, but that's actually an area of opportunity that we're even looking at ourselves. When we think about the whole value stream around electrification, it's not just the vehicle, but there's the batteries, there's the, uh, there's the motors, there's potentially the, the charging stations. Is that an area that, as an OEM, and perhaps with others in a partnership that uh, we might want to be involved in to sort of proactively uh, make the um, opportunity more attractive and accelerate its development. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Um, unless there's somebody Oh, yeah, second question, yes. The, the second question. See, I forgot uh, you had a second question. <laughs> um, so a lot of the talk is that uh, autonomous vehicles, the future is um, either a large portion or a portion of being ride-sharing mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. uh, that being the case, um, mm -hmm. I have a two-year-old. One of the reasons I haven't completely left having a car and going fully on ride sharing is a car seat. Mm -hmm. It's completely critical and the reason mm -hmm. why I don't do 100% car sharing. Do you envision these autonomous vehicles being able to accommodate cars, built-in car seats or something mm -hmm. along the lines mm -hmm. that will really allow parents and people of different ages and mm -hmm. capacity to be able to use them? Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I, I think you know what will happen with uh, autonomous vehicles, they'll actually look different than cars today. Uh, the interiors will be different. Um, because if you think about it, I mean, what are you going to do? <laughs> you know, today you're, you're occupied, you're driving, right? Uh, you won't have to do that. So there'll be all sorts of opportunities, I think, that, uh, you know, that companies like us can offer in terms of that environment and what experiences you have in that environment. In fact, if you think about it, is the car is just a robot, how can you as an OEM offer sort of a branded experience uh, for the consumers as they're using that particular product? And so that's something we're spending a lot of time working on. Mm -hmm. So I do think that um, you know, we'll have to satisfy the needs of the elderly, uh, satisfy the needs of uh, people that, uh, you know, for example, with children. So yeah, I think that definitely is something that, uh, that you'll see coming from all of us that offer autonomous vehicles. Now, just one last, you can come on up, just one last comment. So on the point of individual ownership, our point of view is that initially it will be uh, ride sharing and ride hailing because the cost of the vehicle will be such that for it to be economic, and it will make a lot of sense to an Uber or a Lyft or whoever, uh, it probably needs to be in that particular environment. Also initially, we think that uh, the vehicle will have to be driven in what we call a geo-fenced area. Now that doesn't mean just a campus or a, you know, a small area. It could be New York City, it could be you know, San Francisco, Berkeley, but it has to be geo-fenced, mapped, uh, so that you know, the vehicle kind of knows where it is and you know, what, what's in its environment. Later, I think the technology will evolve where it can be just an individual car. And if you want to get in the car and go see grandma up in Napa Valley, you know, you can do that. Um, and at that point in time, it'll probably be, I'm guessing, it'll start with more expensive vehicles because, again, the cost will still probably be relatively high. But then over time, it will start to filter down and I think be in, I'll call it, more, more affordable vehicles. And, and we think that will happen probably in the second half of the next decade. Okay. Hi, I'm Tree. I'm a second year full-time student here. And first off, thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. It's always great to hear an executive from such a large and you know, significant you know, company in the US. I wanted to switch gears a bit and ask a bit more on the leadership side. Um, I think there are a lot of, there, recently there have been very large companies like Wells Fargo or Volkswagen that have had to deal with a lot of problems for you know, scandals that come out of their companies. And I think a very valid question is, how much responsibility does the executive team have to take on for these types of issues that come up? And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, as being part of this executive team, how do you parse and how do you think about who's going to take the blame and should I shoulder the blame or do we put it onto a subunit and when does that make sense, when does it not make sense? And I'd love to hear if there's an experience that you've had at Ford where you've had to dealt with this problem and I'd love to hear what you, you, what you thought through it. 
That would okay. be super helpful. So that's a really important question, and particularly for most of you in a way that are looking for jobs at some point in the near future. Let me just talk first about um, those types of events. To me, what you need to think about when you're considering a career is the culture and the integrity, uh, the ethical underpinnings of whatever company you want to work with. I think that's really, really important. To me, what those types of issues suggest is something in the culture, something in the ethical um, values of that particular company that, that was lacking, that would have enabled something like that to happen. And, uh, and I have to say, I think at Ford, of course, I would say that, but I have to tell you, I really do think that, and in part because we're still a family company. We still, our exec chairman is still Bill Ford Jr., uh, great grandson of Henry Ford, and, and he's got very strong ethical values, and the family feels very strongly about the integrity of the company because it's the integrity of the family, if you will. Uh, so I think that's something very important that you should consider when you're thinking about who you want to work with, and I think that can be a huge inhibitor from, now we've got over 200,000 people, so I'm sure there's somebody somewhere today doing something that I would, oh, don't do that. <laughs> but in general, if you've got the right culture, it won't go far and it will be found and it will stop. So I think that's the first thing. If in fact uh, there were something that, that happened, I mean, the senior management has to take responsibility for it, flat out, because. Does that mean leaving? Could it, it could. It could mean uh, resigning, it could be compensation related, it could be, uh, you know, it could be anything. But you have to take accountability and responsibility for those types of things in my point of view. Let me just give you a personal example. Very, very small example, but for me it was difficult. So uh, back in maybe about 2000, I think it was 2000, uh, I had just become the CFO of Mazda in Hiroshima globally. And Mark Fields, who's now the head of Ford, was also the head of Mazda. And uh, he and I had been part of negotiations with um, Daihatsu because at the time we, uh, we basically had Suzuki uh, build for us and then badge Mazda uh, what are called K-cars, these 600cc cars that are very, very small that are a big part of the Japanese automobile industry. We didn't make them, but we wanted to participate. So uh, we had Suzuki make them for us. Well, we were thinking maybe we could get a better deal with Daihatsu, which made the same vehicles. So we entered it in some negotiations with, uh, with Daihatsu, and myself, Mark, and, and other members of the Mazda team went to, I think it was Osaka for negotiations. So we went there, had negotiations with them, and so forth. Came back, and then like a week later, my secretary came in, and she gave me this package, and it was bundled up. It was my entire binder of all the materials that we had developed for the negotiations, all the backup schedules, all the data, all our financial uh, models around that business that I had left mm -hmm. in the room mm -hmm. that we had negotiated uh, in with Daihatsu. And the head of the Daihatsu team had sent it back to me and with a little note that said, you left this, we don't need to say anything about it. And I had only been CFO for maybe it was two months. I hadn't worked directly with Mark. I'd worked as a peer with him a bit, but not directly too much. Oh my God, I, I, I literally thought my, my career was over. You know, how could I be so thoughtless and careless? So what I did, you know, gulping five times, I, Mark's office was right across from mine. We shared sort of a common area where the, the two assistants sit. I walked over and I went in to see him and I said, I have to talk to you. And he said, okay, well, what? And I said, I've done something really, really, really horrible. He said, what? And I had the binder and I gave him the note and I explained what I had done and I said, if you want me to, you know, to resign, I will. And he said, no, he said, thank you for telling me. It's okay, don't worry about it. So there was a number, number of things. One is I felt like I had done the, I had to do what I did based on my own value structure. But it also told me, some, told me something about Mark in terms of the fact that I could go with him and tell him anything, uh, and he would be open to hearing it, and he would weigh you know, how serious or not that was. I actually thought it was quite serious, but I'm not sure I would have done the same thing. But, um, <laughs> uh, but it also made me trust him more, and I think what it probably did too is it told him he could trust me, that I would always be open and transparent to him. 
So I think, and you know, take that and blow it up to a whole company. I mean, you have to work that way. You have to be, you have to be fact-based. You have to be transparent. You have to live your values. You screw up sometimes, and when you screw up, you have to admit it. You need to fix it, and then you go on, and you go back into your processes and try to figure out, you know, how could that have happened? Uh, you know, where was the error state? And in my case, it was just I was an idiot. Not much you could do about that. <laughs> but um, so I, I think that's. Maybe that helps you in terms of how I think about that topic. Great. For sharing. Okay. Hi, uh, Salim Salam, second year MBA student mm -hmm. from Turkey. Uh, half of my family is actually working at the Ford factory near Istanbul. And we oh, appreciate yeah. the fact that Ford- Ford Olazan, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Ford continued to invest in the region after mm -hmm. the big earthquake in mm -hmm. 19. Actually, you know, that earthquake went right through yes. the middle of that yes. new plant. Yeah, and I visited the factory on several occasions, funky place. Oh, you did? But going back to your operations in the U.S., we're in the election season, uh -huh. and um, creating jobs, maintaining the competitiveness of the U.S. companies, mm -hmm. U.S. manufacturers, vis-a-vis -vis its uh, competitors around the world has been one of the recurring themes mm -hmm. in the debates and during the campaigns. Mm -hmm. And the first uh, 30 seconds, actually, we were mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> There you go. And f like you mentioned in the uh, first 30 seconds of your speech, that Ford is an iconic U.S. company. Mm -hmm. So what kind of policy mm. climate are you expecting from the new president that is going to enable Which Ford? one? <laughs> <laughs> now, let me make a general comment first, and then I'll talk about the specific issues. Yeah. So, you know, we've been around for a long, long time. We've, we work in, you know, so many countries around the world. We're in China. We're in India. Brazil, Argentina, we've, in Venezuela, you know, talk about operating difficult places. So we've, you know, we've, we've dealt in different types of governments, different types of administrations and so forth, different rules. So I think we know how to operate with whoever's in charge. Uh, and in general, um, you know, the auto company, an auto company is seen as a big uh, economic driver of GDP, jobs, growth, technology, you know, higher wage positions. So generally governments um, will try to work with you because it's their advantage to do so, although everyone's got their own way of, you know, what those rules are around doing that. So I think whoever's elected, whether it's, um, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump, uh, will figure it out. And, and hopefully both of them um, are going to focus on what is important to all of us, which is a growing a growing economy, jobs, technology, so that the, you know, the boats for everybody just continue to rise. Uh, and we would play a, a major role in that. Now, around the specific issue, and this is around uh, Mexico, um, I will speak to facts, which have been in short supply <laughs> lately. But here's, oh, here's the facts. So since, and I mentioned this to a, a, a group this morning, a student group, since 2011, We've invested $12 billion in the U.S. We have added 28,000 jobs. Today, we build more vehicles in the U.S. than any other company. Today, we have more employees in the U.S. than any other company. Um, and on the specific issue of small vehicles, today we build the Focus and the C-Max in a big plant right outside Michigan. It's called Michigan Assembly. So what we announced some time ago with the UAW is that we were going to uh, not build those products there in the next generation. They would be built elsewhere, and we've subsequently confirmed that that's a new plant in Mexico. And we're going to replace those products with two brand new products that are going to be very successful and higher margin than the small cars, if you will, which will actually make the future of that plant much more robust. Uh, and as a result of that, there is not one job that will be lost in the U.S. Uh, from that change because we're actually expanding our portfolio, putting those products there. So the, uh, the conversation and dialogue around us, you know, taking a small car division out, we don't actually have a small car division, but, you know, taking that out, moving jobs, leaving the U.S., it's, you know, there's, it's ludicrous. Okay? Thanks. So building on the topic of manufacturing, um, it turns out that in this case, you had a very good logical answer for how the U.S. isn't losing jobs. Um, when you're making that type of decision in terms of a manufacturing or production decision, to what extent are you considering the potential political ramifications? Um, and then secondly, going back to manufacturing in general, 
how are you thinking about um, readying the workforce for a higher level of automation, a different type of mm -hmm. manufacturing skill set? Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a lot that goes into deciding you know, where we build products. Uh, it's not any one thing. Uh, obviously, we've already made a huge investment. I mean, we're very capital intensive, you know, very big dollars that we have to put into plants and so forth. So not continuing in a location is a huge decision because the amount of investment you've already put in and the amount you'd have to invest elsewhere. So it's not lightly done. And you have to have a really strong business case um, just right off the top to, to even think about doing something like that. There's then issues around the workforce uh, because uh, if you were to leave and if a workforce is sort of abandoned, it's extremely expensive and a lot of cash involved in helping them uh, because we don't just give them a box and say, here's your things. It's actually, uh, you know, we spent uh, back in that downturn that I mentioned, we spent, um, I forgot the exact number now, but between 100 and $200,000 per person that left in terms of, uh, you know, compensation and so forth. Billions and billions and billions of dollars in cash flow at the wrong time. <laughs> That's just what we do. Um, we have to think about the union because, for example, in the United States, the unions involved. So, for example, the decision that I talked about uh, with the focus on the CMAX that was done th in the last negotiations with the UAW. So they were part of that decision, actually. Um, uh, political, well, one of the things that we think about, for example, is uh, what type of incentives might we get? Either you know where we stay where we are or go someplace else, and then there's also something that we look at around. Uh, 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 I'll call it political risk. You know, is it a country that you're concerned about? Have you over concentrated your uh, production in a particular uh, location? So we think about that. We also think about, uh, for example, uh, trade agreements. You know, uh, Mexico happens to have free trade agreements with just about everybody, so it's actually a really good place to export to. So that's a consideration. So there's many, many factors that come into it. Uh, it's not simple, but it's also not something we actually do very often. I mean, generally, you know, we have a plant, we'll continue to invest in a plant, uh, but at times, for example, the downturn that I talked about before, or if we see a major shift uh, on the competitive front that more and more competitors are servicing a market through products that are sourced elsewhere at lower cost, then it becomes a big competitive disadvantage for us because the prices are the prices. So all those things have to go into uh, a decision, but it's not lightly made, and actually it's not one that we make very often. Is that okay? Did I not answer a part? Automation in the workforce? Oh, yeah. So that's, that's a really good question. We are, I mean, the plants now are very high tech. I mean, if you went into our plants and saw them, I mean, they are extremely, extremely high. A lot of computer equipment and so forth. So there is a lot of training that goes into place. Uh, we're also having to bring in people that have, you know, higher levels of, uh, of, of expertise into the plants. Um, it's not like it was, you know, even 20 years ago, much less 30, 40 years ago. So it's a, it's a different level of expertise that's required. We also provide a lot of training in the plants as well to give people the opportunity to skill up uh, as well. But it is, um, it's a different world now than it was before. Okay. MBA and I'd like to ask you about your thoughts on collaboration across the industry. So for autonomous vehicles I see there's a massive opportunity in a collaboration in terms of sharing information across networks of cars on the road uh, obviously when it hits a critical mass mm -hmm. maybe five ten years down the line and I'm curious if Ford sees this as a priority and if so uh, what steps are you taking to uh, develop maybe a common standard across uh, the, the other car manufacturers to create the environment where people can be assured of safety, mm -hmm. uh, efficiency across the entire fleet? Mm -hmm. This is a little bit tied to the earlier question I had around the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications and vehicle-to-infrastructure communications. So I do think that uh, you know, there will have to be some sort of agreed standards with cities, states, governments, uh, and also uh, other OEMs to make sure that we've got the ability to have all these different branded vehicles communicate with each other and also different branded vehicles to communicate with infrastructure. So that is an area of work that's still ahead of us. I think there's discussions that have already started on that, but it's probably not as well advanced as you know, some of the other aspects of autonomy, particularly what I mentioned earlier around the, the, the framework and guidelines around safety and the validation of the integrity of the of the vehicle's ability to safely carry people in an autonomous mode. 
but that will be something very, very important, uh, you know, a little bit beyond that. Okay? Okay? Bob, I think the first time I got a chance to meet you, you were visiting here on the Berkeley campus. Mm -hmm. You had some of your senior team with you, mm -hmm. at least one or two of them from Berkeley. And we were having lunch with a number of our engineers from our College mm -hmm. of Engineering, right? And that was a fascinating, I should say, lunch for me to sit in on, right? Because I'm an outsider to your industry, but the notion of technology as a driver for all that you're thinking about, we got a sense for that from your comments here today. Mm -hmm. And we w I was hoping that they would get a little piece of what I got that last time that you were here. It was really valuable for me, I want to say that. You were, among many of your answers, your story about the, you know, the, the left binder is not <laughs> one that we will forget. Nor will I. And <laughs> <laughs> Top of mind. And I should also add, just, you know, you, you've, you've led in so many ways, right? Making sure that we were bringing all of the talent that we can into our organizations, right? The LGBT mm -hmm. community, we, the Ally Challenge actually is one of the things that Berkeley is very, very proud of. Our business school did very well and, and need to continue to do better. Uh, we salute you and all that you and Ford have achieved. Thank you for being thank here you. today. Thank you, and thank you. Thank you.